How do you identify yourself? More specifically, what groups would you say that you belong to? <laughs> I'm not just talking about Facebook groups or Discord groups. I'm talking about the groups that you interact with every day. The groups that you feel that you belong to. You may identify as a student of Temple University. Or you may identify as a member of your immediate family. Or maybe even as a Catholic. For every group that you belong to, there's an opposing group. There's another group out there. These are people that don't identify in the same way. You might call them the others. The students who go to other colleges, who come from other families, or practice other religions. These groups, and more importantly, the conflicts between them, have shaped human history. For example, fighting over land in the name of religion has created many countries, borders, and policies that we abide by today. Conflicts between different racial, ethnic, or religious groups still dominate our headlines and affect the lives of people all around the world. So along with that, why are we so loyal to the groups that we belong to? And why does identification with one group inevitably cause conflict with another group? Finding the answer to both of these questions has become a lifelong work for many social psychologists. And one of these British psychologists is Henry Tajfell. In the late 1970s, Tajfell and his team conducted a series of studies that would lead to the creation of something called the social identity theory. And this video is all about that social identity theory and how it plays into the ways that individuals and groups make decisions. As individuals, we go through usually three stages and enter into groups, which eventually develop into the us versus them mentality that has shaped the story of human history. These three stages are categorization, identification, and comparison, and I'm going to go over each one of them. So the first stage of the social identity theory is categorization. You cannot belong to a group unless you know that that group exists. And we do this through observation of the world around us. It happens all the time, usually without you even thinking about it. It doesn't take long to see that people are divided into different groups. All it takes is you can just walk into a school cafeteria, or you can listen to the news. Groups are labeled by their religion, their nationality, physical abilities, so on and so forth. I could be here until tomorrow, coming up with ways that humans have categorized other humans. Basically, they categorize things that set people apart. And a lot of how you do this categorization is based on how you were raised and where you grew up. Secondly, identification. Once you start to categorize the world into different groups, it's time to look at yourself. How do you identify? And there's so many ways to answer this question. You can identify yourself as a man, a woman, or a non-binary person. You can identify as a Catholic, a Muslim, or a Scientologist. You can identify as straight, lesbian, or pansexual. Or you can choose to identify as none of these things. When it comes to psychology, what you identify with is literally limitless. I know these topics may not be the most politically correct, but it shows how fluid our identities are. Understanding your identity and what you want to be does more than just continue to simplify how you look at the world and the different groups within it. It can also give you a sense of belonging, which is very powerful. In fact, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is and has remained a crucial model for understanding human behavior and what motivates us to make decisions. And at the bottom of this hierarchy, the very basic level is something called basic needs. Before we can explore the world at large, we need to feel safe and know where our next meal is coming from. And once these basic needs are satisfied, we then seek love and belonging. And we can get this love and belonging simply by identifying with certain groups. This desire for belonging may also influence the way in which we mold ourselves to fit into that group. For example, maybe you join a fraternity and you start wearing that fraternity's letters around campus. Or maybe you become a young professional and jazz up your wardrobe to look more like the other professionals at your work. Hairstyles, fashion trends, and even decisions on where to live may all be influenced by a person's desire to fit in with a certain group. And even the style of our hair or the car that we drive makes it obvious that we belong to a certain group. For example, I drive a Mustang, and there's tons of other people out there that don't drive Mustangs, but hate on them all the time. But I have traveled a lot, and I have found that other Mustang owners connect very tightly to other Mustang owners. As another example, when we communicate this identity to people in that group, we are then validated and we feel a necessary sense of love and belonging. As another example, one of my friends recently got a nose ring, which is something I normally wouldn't expect of him. Anyways, we went to a sense deprivation tank, which I highly recommend, and the cashier there immediately complimented him on it. At first, I thought it was really crazy how quickly they hit it off. They had a 20 minute conversation in the lobby, but then I realized the cashier also had a nose ring, and that they were in the same group. In short, they identified with their nose rings, and it brought them closer together. So after categorization, and then identification, comes comparison. So why do we get this type of validation for making our identities more obvious? 
It's because the last stage of the social identity theory is comparison, and this is where the us versus them mentality starts to come into play. One of Henry Tajfel's experiments regarding the social identity theory asked participants to compare and assess people in different groups, and these participants were given a group to identify with. Throughout the experiment, Tajfel's team asked participants to give points to other participants, and even though the groups were arbitrary, they weren't really categorized by any meaningful manner, participants were more likely to give points to people in their group. And this is a clear reflection of how we compare ourselves and people in our group to outsiders. It's in our nature to make these categorizations and comparison. Yuval Noel Harari, author of one of the great books Sapiens, says, Homo sapiens evolved to think of people as divided into us and them. Us was the group immediately around you, whoever you were, and them was everyone else. In fact, no social animal is ever guided by the interests of the entire species to which it belongs. No chimpanzee cares about the interests of the chimpanzee species, and no snail will lift a tentacle for the global snail community. Early Homo sapiens weren't motivated by identity politics. They were motivated by limited resources, including food, water, and shelter. They could trust that people in their own group would share the wealth and provide for people within their own group. But them? Letting them have access to these limited resources could threaten the livelihood of our whole group. This mentality could explain why people in Tajfel's experiments were more likely to give points to people in their own group. And this story is all too familiar. Have you ever heard someone say that they are worried that immigrants are taking jobs away from citizens? Or that the country is overrun by people of a different faith or identity? These are the same fears that early Homo sapiens had when they lived as hunter-gatherers. It's just a different environment. These fears motivate politicians to make laws banning people from having certain rights, or even as history has shown, putting others in internment camps. As I near the end of this video, I want to say that there is a lot more to learn and explore with social identity theory. And after all, not everyone who is part of a group wishes or chooses to be identified with that group. For example, having the label of convict or felon can be hard to move on from, but I think that's a topic for another video. And within these groups, people can move up the ranks or down the ranks and actually be categorized into even smaller groups. So keep learning, keep listening, and keep exploring different areas of psychology that might provide further insight into the ideas of identity and belonging. I hope you guys have learned a bit about how social identity theory works, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below or watch more of my videos in the social psychology playlist. Thank you so much for watching.